Please welcome R. Jesse McWaters, World Economic Forum, Joe Colangelo, Consumers Research, Stephen Malby, Commonwealth Secretariat, Jed McCaleb, Stellar.org, and Ni Quinor, Ghana.com. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, financial inclusion is a topic that I'm sure everyone in this room is very passionate about. And I think there's a growing body of evidence that access to financial tools and services can mean the difference between poor households being able to absorb a shock or capitalize on an opportunity that allows them to pull themselves out of poverty. The, the stakes in this matter are enormous. Over two billion people worldwide are financially excluded, relying on informal processes that are both inefficient and insecure. Surely blockchain technology must be equipped to be a core component to solving a whole set of these problems. But before we get too excited about this, I want to focus our discussion by taking a moment to recall another innovation that promised to serve the bottom of the, period, the, the, bottom of the pyramid, called the play pump. Now, now, some of you may remember it. It was this idea of a spinning merry-go-round attached to a water pump for rural communities. And it was, it was an elegant idea. The notion was that you gave kids a space to play, and communities got free drinking water. The trouble was in the execution, that it didn't really quite work out that way. Despite millions in investment from global aid agencies, the pumps proved very expensive, extremely difficult for local communities to maintain, and most importantly, they were enormously inefficient, requiring up to 27 hours a day of play by children to meet the water goals of a basic community. And so, to kick off the discussion, I want to do so on a bit of a down note. I want to ask our panelists to take a moment to introduce themselves, and first, to provide an instance of where blockchain technology is a bad fit to an existing and important problem around financial inclusion. Where shouldn't we be using the blockchain to try and solve a problem? And from there, we can move on to talking about the enormous number of opportunities that do exist in this space and that the blockchain has the potential to help us uh, unlock. So let's start with you, Joe. Uh, so my name is Joe Colangelo. I run Consumers Research. We are the nation's oldest consumer organization, actually America's oldest consumer organization since this is an international conference. Um, we've so, so to that extent, we're, we're most interested in the underbanked and unbanked in America, which have been growing. Uh, in 2009 to today, there are about five million more underbanked households um, you know, over those last five, seven years. So you know, the, the question is, um, what is the solution you know, in, in terms of this industry to that group of people? Um, I'm not sure that uh, Bitcoin uh, or these, you know, the financial token of open source protocols is in itself uh, a solution for these people. Uh, the, the majority of American households are not underbanked or unbanked because of uh, a technical barrier, a, a technological um, problem that you know, their communities aren't served by banks. It's, it's because they, you know, they're not attractive bank customers. The banks don't offer free checking and they can't afford uh, checking or they, you know, they don't have identification. Maybe they're not in America legal, with a legal status. And, and, and so the, the Bitcoin alone um, is probably not going to be the, the, the impetus for getting them uh, into, you know, included in the financial system. Um, however, you know, there, there are a number of identity companies that are, that are here that are, serve, that are targeting America, um, that are using the blockchain, that are tar targeting American consumers. Those might be, um, you know, linked with Bitcoin, a, a valuable uh, first step in the right direction. Great. So Stephen? Positive, too. Thank you, Jesse. Um, so I'm from the Commonwealth Secretariat uh, Rule of Law Division. We, we have an interest in this area. Uh, through our virtual currencies working group, which is working with Commonwealth uh, Attorney Generals, Ministers of Justice, to look at uh, the responses to blockchain technologies and virtual currencies and how they can, they can benefit developing countries in particular the best. Um, I think uh, I'm not going to give you one sort of straightforward, simple example, uh, I'll go for the politician's answer, but I think what we have to think about here um, is firstly, what does financial inclusion mean? Um, and I would argue it's not as simple as just having a bank account. 
Uh, it's also about access to credit, short and long term. It's about access to savings, to insurance, uh, and of course to payment systems. Um, and then we have to say, what does distributed ledger technology bring? Uh, and of course, we know it can bring currencies themselves, uh, tokens of value. It can be used for registration of assets. Um, it can be used for digital identity. Uh, and then we say, so what are the reasons why people don't have that financial uh, services themselves? And we see, of course, distance. We see cost. We see identity. Uh, we see issues of trust. Uh, and then we have to look and say, well, how do you address those issues through distributed ledger technologies? Um, if you want one reason why people don't necessarily have a, a financial inclusion and financial services, um, interestingly, religion and culture comes up. So you see, for example, in Niger or Cameroon, that between a, a quarter and over one third of people don't have a bank account because they say there's a cultural or, or religious barrier to that. Um, blockchain may be nearing a religion, perhaps, but I'm not <laughs> sure it, it's going to address uh, that particular factor. Um, I, I think I'd also add, um, what do we want to achieve with the financial inclusion and financial services anyway? Um, and you see, for example, studies that uh, literally just look at access to microcredit for households. Well, it's not automatic that having microcredit access is going to give you improvements in education and health and welfare for that household. It depends how it's used. So we need to ask, what do people want to use financial services for uh, and which particular ones are going to suit them best? And simply putting a blockchain to that financial solution is not necessarily going to meet the needs that they actually have. Fascinating. Jed? Uh, yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Jed McCaleb, uh, founder of Stellar, uh, Stellar.org. Um, Stellar is seeking to uh, be a universal payment network similar to the way email works, but for payments where it links. Uh, it's an open payment standard linking all the different financial networks and services together. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think with Blockchain, it's important to keep in mind that it only solves part of the problem of financial inclusion. There's a lot of stuff that is, is not really a technical problem. It's you know, either a regulatory problem or education problem or uh, even like a connectivity problem, which blockchain, blockchain will never solve. Uh, people, very bottom pyramid people, don't even have internet access, which is obviously makes blockchains kind of inaccessible to them. So uh, blockchain is only one part of the solution, but, but I think a, a very good part. So. And then finally, a man who's been central to uh, solving the problem of internet access. Ni, what, what are your thoughts on this? Okay, um, my name is Ni Kueno. I'm from Ghana, and uh, I happen to be the chairman of Ghana.com, uh, which is, uh, you might say, an accredited registrar for generic uh, TLDs. Uh, in Ghana, we try to offer domestic e-commerce because we believe that it's from the improvement in the domestic e-commerce that we can get the benefits uh, of the internet, really, in terms of the economy. Um, of course, more recently, we've started to uh, establish a mining operation in Ghana, which is going well so far. With regards to your use case, um, I cannot tell whether this problem could not be solved by blockchain, but I can describe the problem for you. Central Bank uh, about five, six years ago intended to help the unbanked and they came out with a solution that can work offline uh, as well as uh, online. So the post has had two cards. Uh, it's, uh, it's biometric. Uh, it has a card for the merchant and a card for the client. So they remove the stuff from the wallet of the client, uh, but then the merchant has to connect to do the reconciliation. Now, that was intended to help the unbanked. Uh, unfortunately, the, your water example is not the only one that did not work. Uh, this one did not also achieve that. But it gained something else, which was government started using it because of the identification for the purpose of paying individuals to remove ghost names from, from various payrolls and so on and so forth. So it's not always that you get straight to the target. Sometimes you have to go around different ways to get value. And I think that's an example. Excellent. So I think with that grounding in place, let's talk a little bit about where we see the most exciting opportunities. There's been discussion of blockchain for domestic payment networks, for G2C, uh, for the creation of digital identity to facilitate and reopen remittance corridors. There's a lot of exciting buzz in this space about how Bitcoin and blockchain and distributed ledgers broadly can support financial inclusion. 
When you look forward over the next two to three years, where do you see the most exciting opportunities emerging? Nee, maybe we'll, we'll start with you this time. Okay. Um, I think there are many areas of opportunity. Uh, of course, the success story in parts of our world is uh, mobile money and its achievements. In Ghana, we have four of them. Um, and they are doing a billion a month and retention of currency, maybe 200 million. So it's certainly an active area. And I think uh, Bitcoin can compete and solutions around blockchain can compete in that area. Uh, but beyond that, uh, there's a problem of identification. We still don't have a, a good identification system. And uh, if these types of solutions can address that, that would be very useful. Uh, the remittance area seems to be opportune. I see many attempts from uh, Ghana to address that. Uh, although most of the ecosystem is now kind of hidden and uh, the objective is to unveil it. And when that happens, we'll know the true state of uh, how things are going. But the opportunities are all over. It's just that we have to concentrate and take them one by one. I have started with the mining, but I'm sure in due course, I'll look at other things as well. Jet, I know that Stellar has been doing some work in, uh, in Nigeria. Could you talk a little bit about uh, sort of what you're hoping to see over the next couple of years? And, and if possible, to comment on this, uh, this question of identity. Is that something you're, uh, how are you dealing with that? Sure, yeah. Well, um, we're, we're mainly focused on trying to build a domestic payment network in Nigeria. What, what you've seen is like one of the really early uh, success stories in financial inclusion was M-Pesa in Kenya where it just became kind of overnight this, this uh, very ubiquitous way for people to have essentially what ended up being like lightweight bank accounts on their phone. Uh, and people have tried to replicate this in lots of countries and it's, it hasn't worked to the extent it has worked in Kenya because in Kenya there was just one telco that was the dominant one and so if you had mobile money on that one phone then you could send anyone else in the country. Whereas in Nigeria I think that there's maybe like five telcos and none of, none of the mobile monies interoperate. And so it's way less useful than in Kenya. So what Seller's trying to do is make a common um, language for them, a protocol for the, the different mobile monies to interoperate. So you will be able to send easily between one phone and another. So it's kind of like an open source in PESA that, that can end up being this global one where you can send even cross border. Um, so that, that's what we're mainly focused on in, in Nigeria. And for us, we're not, we're not really focused on the, the identity piece as much. I mean, I know it's obviously a, a problem and a big, big part of the puzzle. Uh, but that, that, that piece is left to the mobile carriers or, or the, the, the institutions that plug in to connect to the Stellar network. They still have to do the identity piece of their own. Stephen, your remit spans a, a vast array of countries at, at different levels of development. What are the most exciting things that you're seeing? Sure. Now, I think in the immediate short term, um, the potential for reduction in costs for remittances um, and the potential broadening of people who are sending remittances, I think, is, is very good. It may not be the most groundbreaking, exciting thing, but if you're uh, sending your remittances at the moment and you're a family in a developing country dependent on those remittances, this is actually going to have a very significant impact on day-to-day on -day life. Um, typical remittance costs at the moment, probably 7 to 8% in a good case. Um, the recent ADIS uh, Financing for Development Conference at the international level has set targets to bring that to below 3% on average um, with no higher than 5% for any particular remittance corridor. Um, and if some of the uh, new technologies can achieve that, then that is going to have a real impact um, uh, for people's lives uh, and daily uh, expenditure. In terms of a bit longer term and potentially more groundbreaking and exciting, um, I think that the linkage of payments to commodities such as prepaid electricity meters, for example, which can be charged up directly by a remittance um, is a very exciting development, uh, allowing the, the sending of cash directly to, to provide a, a needed service. Um, I also think there's a lot of potential around the use of smart contracts and tying those to payments. Um, so imagine, for example, uh, that you could have uh, a crop failure insurance uh, where you have a smart contract which has a data feed into it that gives you the average rainfall um, that can trigger a payment to you if the rainfall is below a certain level automatically. That would simply require the mobile payment uh, infrastructure um, but would make a very large difference because people would know that they would receive that money. Uh, and this in turn 
uh, helps people to move from sort of safer um, subsistence crops to actually take the risk to run a cash crop where they could actually then earn some money and they know that if there's a failure on that for any reason they would receive an insurance payout uh, and I think the potential around there is, is huge. And then Joe you're obviously focused on protecting consumer interests are there particular aspects of the use cases you're seeing develop that are interesting? So I was going to talk about remittances. Thanks, Stephen. You talked about three things there, and remittances is one of them. <laughs> I would say that it is, a, you know, on, on the remittances side, just to add, it, it is a, an incredibly uh, expensive logistical network. So it is, there's over a million, uh, you know, remittance offices worldwide, and you know, it is a, it ends up being a very regressive uh, cost. You know, it is born, you know, these these seven eight percent, which can be fifty or a hundred percent if you're you know, if you get caught sending a, you know, $25 to the wrong country uh, and it all disappears, right? These are borne by, uh, you know, the, the poorest and the most vulnerable uh, populations in the world. So, um, you know, what an alleviation that's going to be. Um, and I guess I would just add that, um, and this, this really is an American uh, focus, but Bitcoin 1.0, and, and I know that blockchain is cool now and Bitcoin isn't, but Bitcoin 1.0 for that, that's the section of people who are financially excluded um, by culture or by law or you know by force, people who could not leave the house with things of value. Uh, I'm thinking specifically of women um, in Afghanistan and a number of other countries. Um, Bitcoin 1.0, without any of the other service layers that have yet to be built, like has the potential to fundamentally transform their lives, to give them ownership of value, um, you know, to receive value and keep that value for themselves for the first time. So without all the service layers that are going to be built and are really going to be transformative. Um, it already has, you know, made a, has the potential to have a profound impact on them. Fascinating. It, do you want to jump yeah. in there, Nate? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to point out that remittances are both directions. And I've seen examples in Ghana in which uh, folks are using it to actually give coins to parents so that they can send to their kids overseas. So it, it, it has different sides of it. It's not always coming from the developed to uh, Africa, but some cases we also need to support our wards overseas, and we don't have very good ways of doing that. And maybe perhaps Bitcoin is an avenue for that as well. And I think that's an excellent point. There's a temptation to think of this very unidirectionally, but it can reverse. And also, there's the sort of emergence of uh, of, of many new corridors of sort of south-south uh, remittances as well, which I think are very important. So, so these are exciting outcomes. I, I want to first focus on the kind of domestic use cases that Ni nee and that Jed talked about. Um, if you could sort of snap your fingers or, or wave a magic wand, what are the things that you would want to see changed in order to really enable the acceleration of these, uh, these domestic use cases? What are the critical conditions that need to come into play over the next couple of years to really see these solutions reach scale? Jed, maybe we'll start with you. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think for, for at least for the domestic payment networks, I mean, the big problem is uh, lack of interoperability. So like th this problem needs to be solved. Like if, if I'm on one network and you're on another one, there's, there's really no way that we can send money back and forth, right? So um, it is essentially one of just a payment standard. So, yeah. Okay. Me? Okay. The domestic side for Ghana, there are many parts. I mean, there is the part of the central bank switching allowing normal bank cards to be used online. Okay, so for domestic payments, uh, that's becoming uh, a possibility. The mobile money and the non-banking uh, uh, non financial institutions together have reduced, um, you might say, our own bank from 40% to 25% in five years. That's what we have seen, okay. Uh, which means that it's going in the right direction. And so a little bit of push with blockchain type of solutions may indeed help us achieve uh, what we're looking for. But I'm particularly interested in uh, forcing e-commerce to take off. Because currently all you see is um, e-commerce in relation to international and domestic normal practice. Mm -hmm. And I think if we do that, the economies will not get the benefits of the internet. Mm -hmm. So even with Bitcoin, I'm looking for ways by which to be used more domestically Okay, for normal payments, mm -hmm. as well as for e-commerce type of payments, just so that we can uh, pick up the community online. That's the way I, I see it. Yeah. 
And so if, if, I can, if I can dig a little sure. bit more into this, I know one of the criticisms or the challenges that has ex existed in the blockchain space traditionally has been uh, a lack of excellence in, in user experience. And I think over the last six to 12 months, we've seen uh, providers who are really uh, developing retail-focused solutions that are, you know, people who are non-technologists are able to understand and interact with easily. But in the developing world, you often have uh, a further complication around this problem, that often the individuals who are using these technologies will be uh, less educated, less familiar with financial services, or they will be uh, illiterate in some cases. Are there, are there uh, efforts underway to resolve this, and are there complexities in the blockchain uh, system inherently that make this more difficult? Jen, you want to? Yeah, I don't think there's anything inherent in blockchain <coughs> that makes it more difficult than other things. I, th I think blockchain or any kind of payment network should be kind of pushed to the background. The, the end user shouldn't really be even be aware of the rail. It's the same way when you swipe your credit card, you don't really know what's happening, or most mm -hmm. people don't know what's happening when they, when they use their credit card. Um, so it should be a similar thing whether they're using Bitcoin in the background or Stellar or some other system. Um, our, our hope is that the, 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 the existing mobile money thing will just plug into these networks and then the, to them, they'll just be using their normal mo mobile money thing or their normal bank account, and, but in the background, it's using one of these more common systems. Excellent. Yeah. So turning then to the more international, the remittance-based uh, discussions, what are the big barriers that exist there? And I'm, and I'm hoping in this discussion we can dive beyond the, the fact that the AML environment is obviously challenging. Can we get a little bit deeper into what are the things that we could actually change? What are the levers that could be pulled in order to uh, enable freer flow of remittance? Do you want to kick us off, Stephen? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, you said it, but the AML environment is, is definitely a huge <laughs> challenge. And, and in the Commonwealth, we've, we've identified um, quite a trend towards uh, debanking of remitters um, due to uh, banks not being prepared to accept the risk um, for that. Um, we've, we've looked at a number of options um, for that, not all of which are actually around blockchain technologies, but also looking at the idea of having um, emergency banking providers for remitters, um, if they've been debanked from their traditional bank and you may have a, a banking service provider who uh, presumably for some additional fee will be prepared to take that immediate risk in order to stop um, uh, the, the immediate stopping of the flows. I think apart from that however of course in terms of the operationalization of getting um, these remittances through the blockchain um, to a mobile phone and then cashed out in a country uh, still represents a big challenge in particularly in rural areas uh, and one of the big questions is how do you really generate and sustain particularly a network of tellers um, who are able to assist in that process of <coughs> taking a bitcoin and literally turning that into into local currency which can actually be spent um, uh, and I see that there's, there's a lot of challenges around developing that and maintaining it um, I think there's a small challenge as well around trust and understanding, and, and this goes to your point of, uh, of person's uh, financial education levels in a sense. When we look at households um, who don't have access to financial services, they are actually using some form of very informal financial services. They're effectively using um, local contacts who will loan them money, particularly for a very, very high rate, um, which they then have to pay back uh, at whatever time scale. <coughs> And in fact, the costs of that are much, much greater for those informal financial services than they are for the real financial services that they could have through, um, through these type of suppliers. And so I think part of the education process and part of building the trust is to help uh, in the understanding that these services are actually going to cost you much less. So it's not just that they have benefits in their use, but compared to how you're accessing finance at the moment is going to make a big difference. And I think that's also a part of it. Does anyone else want to jump in on this Sure. Um, in the case of Ghana, for the four mobile operators, um, they have over 40,000 agents. And that's just what I want to remove. Mm -hmm. I think it's too many. And that, you know, I mean, I want to remove the intermediaries, really. Mm -hmm. so, so having to deal with 40,000 of them, I think a blockchain-related solution may reduce the numbers in a way. 
I cannot say they will all go away, but I think uh, 40,000 for me seems like it's kind of heavy. And it contributes to the, <laughs> the costs, I'm sure, that are associated with uh, these mobile money things. Now, on the other hand, I think uh, there's really no barrier from the user point of view. I have to agree with you. Uh, it's a user interface thing. Uh, these people are beginning to uh, use advanced services of mobile already, uh, meaning they've reached mobile money. Uh, for some of the rural folks, they are using it. Uh, so they can really understand if they have smartphone. Smartphone penetration in Ghana is 65%. And I think it's, it's continuously rising. So mm -hmm. I, I don't want to preclude that option that we might be able to do it entirely using uh, newer technologies. I would just uh, want to take this opportunity to make a prediction that uh, remittance platforms will be successful using blockchain and Bitcoin or uh, other digital currencies up until the point that people, that, that these coins become fungible in their destinations, at which point we'll, we're going to see the increased amount of tellers, re reduced rates, reduced percentages, until all of a sudden the, the, the success is that there are so many tellers using these things to purchase local goods and services that a remittance becomes the sending of the coin from one address to another. Um, so we, we are going from the, like a full, uh, a full arc where we used to send envelopes of cash and uh, then we had these service layers of uh, Western Union MoneyGram and then eventually much more efficient service providers and then eventually I'm just sending you that digital cash and you, know, you can go to the corner store and use it or it, it's not so volatile um, that you're, you're afraid of it losing its value at some point in the future, five, well, six years. And, I, and I'm really glad that you, uh, that you said that because I think it, it, it dovetails very well with a, a, um, a question that I've received from the audience on this iPad thing in front of me. Um, and that is, how come it is that no developing world countries are developing their own digital currencies like Bitcoin at a large scale yet? And they note that it is useful for things like currency controls and uh, controlling uh, situations of inflation or hyperinflation. So I think this is, this is kind of an interesting question. We've heard a lot of discussion recently about the work that's going on at the Bank of England. Uh, we've heard uh, you know, work going on at the Monetary Authority of Singapore, where there's real consideration of the development of, uh, of digital fiat, people being able to open accounts at the, uh, at the central bank and then move that money around electronically. Has anyone heard discussions of this sort in the, uh, in the developing world, or are there reasons why this wouldn't be under consideration? Okay, um, the situation really is very similar to where we were with the internet around 91, 93. If you look at the map around that time, you see all of Africa was email only at best. There was no full connectivity. So I'm not surprised now if you look at the map, it's not very active in Africa, because we are quite kind of far from the center of the development. So it will take a while, but I'm sure when we begin to attack it, there will be cases of developments coming from the region, uh, which might be like an impesa or equivalent or some other different ways of looking at it. So it's really a, a, a challenge of um, not learning about it early enough, meaning the digital divide. Mm -hmm. And so we want to try and narrow it by starting early now and then encouraging the development of the ecosystem true true on the ground, because right now it's also hidden. So we want to unveil it, and in the process of doing that, more people will learn about it, exchange will go on, and we can start some development as a result. Well, and, you've, and you've set yourself up immediately for the, the next question from the audience was, is there any consideration being given to how to expand these services beyond the reach of, uh, of internet connectivity? Jeb, you're a, you're a technical genius. Uh, Certainly you, we, you, have a, you have a solution here. Yeah, we've done some work on offline transactions. Um, it's still just pretty preliminary, but I mean, at the end of the day, you're gonna have to trust some entity with it because um, it, you can't solve the double spin problem if you're not connected. Um, but it ends up kind of being like a check, like you can write a check and it's essentially an offline transaction that you can, it'll bounce maybe, but um, you know, the hope is that it won't and it's protected by the bank. So we have similar mechanisms to that, but just with like kind of pre-signing transactions, things like this. So it, it's possible, you just, you'll just have to trust some entity. So. Well, I, I tend to favor that, I mean, let's give them connectivity. And uh, th that's the better solution. I, I yeah, think absolutely. I prefer we give yeah. them connectivity. <laughs> maybe we can come up with uh, low bandwidth required you sure. know, requirements, uh, yeah. but I think we have to give them connectivity. Um, everybody has it, let's give it to everybody, 
so we can all grow together in a way would be my, my reaction. Yeah. So let's take a bit of a step back and take a little bit more of a macro view. Do you have a view of what this is going to mean for the evolution of the financial system in which these solutions are occurring, in which a domestic payment network isn't necessarily built by a consortium of banks, but is instead built by, uh, by a group like Stellar? What's that going to mean for the evolution of the financial system in those areas? Is it going to be a leapfrogging? Is there going to need to be catch-up played? What, what are they going to be the implications? I mean, I, I very much think there'll be a leapfrogging. I mean, similar to what you saw with cell phones and mobile penetration, uh, it grew, grew much more rapidly in the developing world than the developed world just because uh, <coughs> the system was so much more broken there. And it's the same case here. Like, payments are so much more broken in the developing world than the U.S. and Europe. So I certainly think they're going to leapfrog where we are, and then we'll be catching up. Talk about, like, financial inclusion, we usually think, like, well, we're all, in this room, we're all financially included, right? Um, but but there, there is a, a higher tier of financial uh, inclusion as well, right? There are Swiss bank accounts. There are contracts, uh, you know, futures contracts that can only be purchased on the Chicago Mercantile, Mercantile Exchange, or, or all of these other assets that, that are usually reserved for the wealthy, right? But, you know, capitalism is not... Uh, you know, it doesn't result in giving stockings, uh, silk stockings to queens. It results in bringing silk stockings to the masses. So another financial inclusion, when you zoom out, is um, you know, President Obama recently said, well, it's a very dangerous world. You know, today, you can have a Swiss bank account in your phone. And he meant it as a bad thing. Um, whereas you know, the future is a financial, a, a trickling down of you know, these things that were generally reserved for uh, the uber wealthy you know, to be able to escape taxes or um, you know, escape uh, surveillance, you know, being given to uh, well, us, but also you know the people at the very bottom. So, like Stephen's talking about the the farmer who can hedge a contract in his you know against his crop, that's available today if if you're able to have uh, if you're able to trade on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. But it, it is this trickling down of all the financial services that are available if you have the money to afford them today. Fantastic. So I want to close with a question that I think is a, is a relevant one for the audience that we have today. We, we have assembled here a fantastic community that includes leading developers, uh, legal minds, members of the financial services community. How can they contribute to the goal of fostering financial inclusion via tools like the blockchain? What are the things that they can sort of take away from today's events uh, and bring back to their uh, to their day to day jobs. So, do you want to kick us off? Absolutely. So, I would say that whether you're a developer, a regulator, or whatever whatever your, uh, industry you're in, if you're concerned about this, if you work at a big bank, go go experience America's alternative uh, financial environment. Go to the go to the payday lender. Go look at a uh, go buy some prepaid cards and read the terms and conditions. Um, you know, go go to the places where people are coming in and signing their checks over at the end of the week and paying twenty five percent. Uh, re just go immerse yourself in that. It's an eye-opening experience, and, and you'll, you, know, you might already realize it, but financial inclusion, as Stephen said, is not just a bank account. It, it is so much more, um, and it's happening on this island. Stephen? It needs action in, in all of those areas. So the developers um, need to keep pushing the boundaries in terms of what is technically possible uh, to put on an app on a phone. Um, the regulators need to keep thinking about uh, is it going to engage money transfer laws or money exchange laws when uh, currencies move between virtual currencies to fiat currencies? Um, and I think it also needs research on really what aspects of financial inclusion are the most important. It's no good going out there um, and pushing all of these products if we don't have the evidence that shows that actually that's going to improve sustainable development, that it's going to improve livelihoods, that it's going to improve welfare. And it's about connecting up all of the developments on the technical and regulatory front with the evidence of what works. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah, I mean, I just think it's important to like focus on these markets. I think a lot of times they're ignored, and uh, particularly for this industry, uh, it's, I think, will be one of the fastest growing areas. So I think it behooves all of us to kind of pay attention to it and, and, and know what the problems are and like, try to solve them. So. Nick? Okay, I think one of the challenges is uh, influencing policy environment in our area so that we can do some of these things. 
So anyone here should talk to a policymaker, and anyone here should try and help build capacity of somebody in the developing world, and that would be sufficient. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a, that's a great diversity of, uh, of views. We need to understand the problem we're solving. We need to build tools that are a fit to solve it. And we need to engage with the users and with the policymakers to figure out how to actually roll those out. I want to thank our fantastic panel here today. What I think has been a very interesting discussion. To thank all of you and uh, wish you a great rest of the conference.